uh, joined by colleagues from the consulate, uh, Vice Consul Sarah Keating, uh, who you all know, uh, Sandra Hamilton, our Public Outreach Officer, um, and then we have Kathleen Hoolan, Katie, um, who has joined us just at the start of this year. Uh, I think Marie is on the call uh, as well, and probably Christina, so, so the full team is here. Um, just a few announcements before uh, before we go to our, our main uh, our main event, our main speaker. Um, we have a busy uh, February ahead, we have a busy year ahead, um, but February uh, is when we mark uh, St. Bridget's Day, the 1st of February, uh, one of Ireland's patron saints, uh, and the Department uh, of Foreign Affairs and our embassies and missions around the world uh, really focus in on St. Bridget's Day as a celebration of the creativity and contribution uh, of Irish women uh, and particularly Irish women in the diaspora. Uh, we uh, had too much to celebrate, so instead of one day, we're doing a full month uh, of, of, of Irish women uh, in design. Uh, so we've got four events for you, uh, one every Thursday. Uh, the details are, are on our website uh, and also in our newsletter. Just really briefly uh, to talk through some of those events, uh, our event, uh, our series will kick off uh, on the 4th of February uh, with uh, Marty Fahey, uh, of the O'Brien uh, Art Collection will speak um, on 150 years of Irish women uh, in the arts. Uh, it'll be a phenomenal uh, tour de raison of, of, of women uh, that have made really phenomenal contributions uh, in the art space, uh, not to be missed. That's on the 4th at 6 p.m. Uh, then the following Thursday, we have uh, an event looking at the present and future of women in Irish design uh, with the Design and Crafts Council of Ireland. We have two uh, very exciting young designers uh, who'll speak about their work. Um, and I suppose uh, crafting the future of Irish design. Uh, that's at noon on uh, Thursday the 11th. Then the next week, uh, we've got a big event uh, with the Chicago Architecture Center. Uh, we have teamed up with them to bring um, uh, Grafton Architects, who, who uh, Shelley Long, uh, Shelley McNamara and, and, and Yvonne Farrell, uh, who won the Pritzker Prize in 2020, which is, as many of you know, the Nobel Prize, uh, the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for architecture. So they'll speak about their work on the 18th uh, and then on the 25th uh, we have an event um, commemorating the life uh, and contribution of Mother Jones, the, the, the labour rights activist, and we'll be announcing uh, a very special commission of a portrait for, for the consulate collection. So we hope you can join us for uh, all of our St Bridget's Day activities, uh, not just uh, our consulate but right across the mission network. There's a whole host uh, of really fascinating events uh, and they're all posted on the embassy website. Um, it's particularly busy as well because we have uh, Sarah will be speaking uh, on the 10th uh, at the International Women's Association um, on the tr contribution of, of women uh, internationally and Irish women. Uh, and then as well, we have uh, the second uh, of a series that the ambassador is leading on called A Farther Shore. Um, and that is a look at Irish history uh, from, uh, from uh, our independence uh, right through to, to the formation of Irish statehood. So a really fascinating uh, series of six or seven uh, lectures right throughout uh, the first six months of the year, but the ambassador will speak a little bit more about that uh, during uh, during our conversation. One more quick announcement, uh, Emigrant Support Programme, which is uh, the department and the government's uh, large grant support programme for our emigrant organisations overseas. Those applications have opened. Um, we in the consulate here support uh, a really strong and large number uh, of very great organisations doing great work to support um, you know, Irish uh, diaspora members that might be vulnerable or in difficulty, uh, also cultural organisations, business organisations. Um, so please do look at that. All details are on our website. And if you have any queries, please ask uh, Sarah. Now down to the main event. Uh, we have uh, a guest uh, here today who needs uh, no introduction, uh, but I'll introduce him anyway because his achievements uh, are, are, are many uh, and really speak to, to many of the key moments in, in Irish foreign policy uh, over recent decades. Of course, it's Ambassador uh, Dan Mulhall, uh, who's joining us from, from DC. Uh, Ambassador Mulhall is the 18th Irish ambassador uh, to the States. Uh, he came to DC in, in 2017 uh, from uh, the ambassadorship uh, in, in London to the Court of St. James. Uh, he's a proud Waterford man. Uh, I'm sure he'll tell you that himself. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and he's an undergraduate uh, uh, and did his undergraduate postgraduate studies in, in UCC. Uh, not just is he uh, a diplomat of, of renown, he's also uh, an academic and an historian. Um, and and uh, you'll, you'll hear that from, from some of the questions and some of the answers that, that he'll give today. Um, he has a long career uh, in the Irish Foreign Service. He served uh, in various uh, posts right around the world, New Delhi, Vienna, uh, Brussels uh, in the EU, Edinburgh. Uh, he was our ambassador to Malaysia 
um, to Germany uh, and as I said uh, to the UK um, where, where he served during a, a really you know a hugely consequential time uh, for British Irish relations uh, and UK EU relations. Um, he hasn't just had he didn't just have a distinguished career overseas he's also served as our Director General for European Affairs back in Dublin um, and notably as well he was part of uh, Ireland's delegation uh, at the time of the Good Friday Agreement uh, in 1998 obviously the you know the key achievement in, in Irish foreign policy in, in recent decades. Um, he's got a keen interest in Irish history and literature. Um, he's been uh, tweeting up a storm uh, over over recent years, um, and is probably Ireland's uh, number one proponent of, of Irish poets. Um, uh, so you can follow him on Twitter at, at Dan uh, Mulhall, where he he regularly reads uh, Irish poets um, and, and blogs about uh, various uh, aspects of Irish culture um, and history. Uh, our conversation will will run till about ten, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit over, uh, but we'll try and keep it uh, to time. Uh, myself and the ambassador will have a conversation for about 30, 35 minutes, uh, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, like uh, our, our fifth Fridays in person, we like to keep them fairly informal. So uh, we encourage you to keep your cameras on if, if, if you wish. Uh, we will be recording the event, so yeah, feel free to turn your camera off if, if you haven't uh, done your hair or, or put on your good suit for the day. Um, but uh, once we get to the questions, pop your question uh, in, in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, and then Sarah or myself will call on you, and you can pop on your pop on your um, uh, your mic uh, and ask the ambassador the question uh, your, yourself. Um, uh, we 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 pitched this as a look at uh, 2021. Uh, I think we're we're only four weeks into 2021, and I think already it's been a hugely consequential year. Um, but first, I'll go to the ambassador um, because he was one of the one of the few people uh, that attended uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris's. Uh, inauguration. So, Ambassador, uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us this morning. And really, I just wanted to ask you, you know, what was it like uh, to be at the inauguration? So many of us watched it on TV, but you were you were there in person. So if you could share some of your experiences. It was wonderful. It was a, a highlight, really. It was, it was a career highlight because, of course, like most other people around the world, I've watched American inaugurations for many, many years on TV. And uh, so to be there in person was something quite special. Now, of course, it was a very strange environment i mean we uh we there was strict social distancing uh there was mask wearing so you couldn't uh, mingle with other guests in the way you could at a normal inauguration and the indoor events that would have taken place in, in a normal year didn't happen this time around and there were no inauguration balls i was looking forward to putting on my uh my black tie and uh wandering around uh, washington with my wife uh, attending these inauguration balls which didn't happen so there were. I did a few a few uh, virtual events uh, to to mark the occasion, and that was great. But but still, I mean, despite all of that, despite the, all of the restrictions and the strange atmosphere in Washington, because we had to go to the State Department um, very early in the morning, and then we were ferried over on buses uh, from the State Department to the Capitol, and the buses had a maximum of ten people on them. That was how strict they were about social distancing. And also driving through the streets of Washington was extraordinary because there wasn't a single person on the street other than you know, the National Guardsmen and other security personnel. So it was a strange day. But just to be there for the occasion was something quite special. And, es and especially to see somebody being inaugurated as US president who has the strongest Irish background since John F. Kennedy. And not only that, but a man who has worn his Irish identity on his sleeve for for decades and continues to do so uh, and did so during the campaign. So I just felt very sort of privileged to be there. And of course, I was one of, we were one of maybe a couple of thousand people. Normally there might be hundreds of thousands of people there, but in fact, we, we were very, we were part of a very small group and it was great to be there. And, uh, you know, we, we um, my wife and I certainly regard it as, a, as one of the highlights of our career. Wonderful, thank you. Well, I suppose, were there any particular moments that, that stuck out for you uh, that day, I know uh, I myself was struck by uh, Amanda Gorman's yeah. poem, uh, yeah. and it really, really powerful. Were there any elements uh, of the day, either that you know we all saw on television, or, or, or that you would have seen uh, being yeah. there, that, that that really struck 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 you? Well, I mean, as a fan of uh, of poetry, I've never written a line of poetry myself, uh, sadly, but but as a fan of poetry and someone who reads poetry um, aloud and and posts videos of my readings, which I'll be doing actually. Next month, I'm, I'm going to do a series of readings of Irish women poets for St. Bridget's Month. Um, uh, but as someone who's used to reading uh, poetry, I just found her performance to be exceptional. In fact, I've, I've just recorded um, 
uh, one of her poems, not the poem she, she read that day, but another poem, but it's also a very powerful poem, and I'm going to post it on uh, St. Bridget's Day as part of our St. Bridget's Day um, program. That, that was very special. I also thought that the, um, you know, the swearing in of Kamala Harris, um, you know, the first person of color to have been sworn into that position, I felt there was a kind of, a, you know, a moment of... Uh, of um, you know, excitement in the crowd when that, when that happened. And, and of course, then, the, you know, the big event of an inauguration is obviously the swearing in of, of the, the president. And that was that, that was very well done. We had very good seats. We were directly in front of the president. We were a little bit back, but we, we could see it very well. And, and, and for me, it was, I, I thought about, you know, the Scanlans, the Roaches, uh, the, the Blewetts from Mayo, uh, the Finnegans from County Loud, all of whom are part of the president's family tree. And I was just thinking, hey, think of those people who came across the Atlantic, probably on a very perilous and rocky journey uh, in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s, and that one of their descendants is now being sworn in as president of the United States. I just, I, it, it literally made me fill up with a, a sort of a, a, a nostalgia and, and a sort of a, a sort of a, a mixture of pride and, uh, and also, you know, uh, you know, nostalgia for, for those people who had to go through such difficult times in order to be, be in America, to, to be one of the ancestors of an American president. Yeah, and you mentioned, uh, you know, obviously you were the, the Irish representative at, at the inauguration, but uh, there were other Irish people uh, there and, you know, Irishness was very present uh, at this inauguration. I know Patricia Tracy, the, the Irish violinist, uh, Seamus yes. uh, Heaney, the curate Troy, I suppose, do you expect yes. this Irish motif to, to continue uh, through uh, President Biden's uh, presidency and administration? I mean, obviously, we shouldn't expect that every speech the president gives will have a reference to Irish poetry. But but I think it's part of what he is. And that tends to come out, you know, I mean, um, because it's just it, it's not as if he suddenly um, decided to wrap um, an Irish heritage around himself for whatever reasons. Everyone knows that it's, it's something that has been part of who he is for, for, for his whole life. I mean, he, he was here a, a couple of years ago um, launching the Cambridge Irish, Cambridge History of Ireland. Um, and he spoke on that occasion very movingly about his Irish heritage. And it wasn't like, it wasn't, I, I was, he had a script in front of him, but what he said that night came from the heart and not from the page that was in front of him. So. I think the fact that he's a genuine sense of Irishness, of Irish American heritage, means that that will come out again and again. But as I say, we shouldn't imagine that it'll come out in every speech he gives, you know? So, so but I think it's important. And, and he's someone who won't have to be told about Ireland, won't have to have it explained to him why it's important that uh, the peace process should be supported and should, be, um, should continue to deliver uh, peace and prosperity to Northern Ireland. He knows that. Uh, and therefore, I think we'll be uh, we'll, we'll be speaking to somebody who has a genuine knowledge of Ireland, and that will be very good from our point of view and from the point of view of, of our relations with the new administration. Thank you. Uh, and obviously, uh, at the moment, where you know, I think everyone's watching the papers. Things are happening at, at a frenetic pace uh, in in DC, both between executive actions and, and the Senate uh, vetting various candidates for the administration, different posts being filled. I imagine it's also a hugely busy time for for the embassy uh, and you know not just the irish embassy but all embassies when, when a new administration uh, comes in can you give us a sense of of, of the work that's going on uh, over there in dc you know unlike any other country i've ever been in um when the administration changes everything changes uh in most other countries you know the head of the european division remains the same whichever government may be in office. But here, all the people that are at the senior levels, or most of them, are actually political appointees, which means that there are, they're all now new people. So the people I talked to over the last three years in Washington have, for the most part, some are civil servants and are staying on, but even they will probably move on with the new administration eventually. So there's a whole new crew coming onto the scene. And we have to engage with them. Now, some of them we know already from past associations and connections with them. You know, for example, uh, Samantha Powers being appointed as head of, of USAID. Well, you know, I've known Samantha. I've known her for, for a while. You know, Mayor Marty Walsh uh, from Boston. 
likewise, uh, someone I've called on and had meetings with, so he'll be here. And then there are a number of others um, in the administration that have clear Irish American backgrounds, Jen O'Malley Dillon, who ran the campaign, and Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor. So we won't be short of, of people to engage with, but you have to do it. I mean, there'll be a lot of people in there that we won't have come across before because they don't have Irish heritage, they don't have Irish connections, and we have to start connecting with them. So it's an exciting time in many ways because you're building, you're starting afresh. Now, of course, the other side of the equation is the Congress. And to a large extent, our, our, I mean, our friends in Congress, with maybe the exception of Peter King, who retired, most of those are back, back in Congress again. So, and indeed, um, Patrick Leahy is now, um, who is a great uh, friend of ours, a uh, friend of Ireland, friend of the embassy, friend of mine. He, of course, now is the most senior. He, he is the uh, president pro tem of the Senate and will be presiding over the, uh, over the uh, impeachment trials. So, you know, we have a lot of people that we've established connections with and they're, you know, they're still around, you know, Richie Neal, Brendan Boyle, all the people in the Ways and Means Committee, all the congressional friends of Ireland. But, but there, we have a lot of work to do in just, first of all, identifying the key people that are taking over roles that are of relevance to us and then engaging with them. And of course, it's more difficult now because, you know, you, uh, you, you, know, you can't easily engage with them in person. You have to do it over the phone. And, you know, even getting people to come to lunch is difficult because, you know, even if you have a socially distanced lunch, a lot of people are not comfortable with it. Now, especially in winter when you can't eat outside, you know. So, so there's, a, there's a bit more, um, it's a bit more challenging this time around than it would be in a normal inauguration. In a normal inauguration, I would have met a lot of these people at the inauguration ceremony. But this time around, of course, that wasn't mm. possible because of the social distancing requirements, which are sensible and I have no problem with them. I mean, I think that's the way it should be. That's the way it would be in Ireland, for example. But, but I mean, but at the same time, it does mean that there's a, you know, I mean, the hill we have to climb in getting to know people is going to be a bit steeper because of the circumstances of the pandemic. Yeah, and the hill we have to climb is all in our, in our spare bedrooms and our, our offices, <laughs> unable, unable to get no, out. We and unfortunately, we, no, at the moment. we can't use the resources of, you know, the residents here, your um, consulate in Chicago, the other consulate around the country, you know, normally we'd be using those to bring people in and we can't do that now. So we got to, you know, rely on phone and Zoom calls and what have you. Yeah? Look, yeah. that's the way it is. C'est la vie, as we say in, uh, in, in, uh, in French. Yeah. A, a busy, right. busy time. I, uh, someone at one of the think tanks here said that uh, presidential administrations are like the tides. So, you know, when a new administration comes in, all of the people from the previous administration uh, no matter where they would have gone to be at a think tank business industry, uh, sort of s start to move back towards uh, DC. Uh, and then obviously when the administration changes, they move out. And, and we found that some of our contacts here have, have moved. You know, one of our key contacts has now gone to be the, the president's scheduler. Um, so uh, that's someone lost for us, but gained, gained for the embassy there uh, that, that, that we well, can share. Well, well, thank you very much. That would be a very useful contact with Paris indeed, yes. <laughs> um, and then I just want to move a bit, I suppose, just to, 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 to the coming years, US-Ireland relations. Uh, obviously, you know, the, I think it was a great source of pride in Ireland that the Taoiseach uh, was one of the first five world leaders that, that President, now President Biden spoke to after his election. I suppose, does this herald a, a, a golden era for, for US-Ireland relations? I think it'll be a very good time for Irish-US relations. Um, I think bilaterally, um, the issues that are on our agenda, uh, immigration, for example, trying to get some, uh, the issue of the undocumented sorted out, trying to create a, a more appropriate avenue for legal immigration from Ireland to the United States, um, dealing with um, in Northern Ireland, continuing the engagement by the US in Northern Ireland, uh, the economic relationship, which has thrived in recent years, and we would expect to see it continue to thrive under the new administration. So all of those things, I think, will be will be moved forward in a positive direction um, by the fact that the new administration, um, as I said, is has more knowledge uh, and awareness of the complexities of Northern Ireland, um, is more oriented towards multilateralism, which again is something we share with them. Uh, I think we'll have a good relationship with them uh, as part of our membership of the Security Council, where you know the tone perhaps of American policy at the UN and multilateral environments generally will uh, change uh, in a way that I think appeals to us. Um, the fact that they rejoined or they re-engaged with WHO, we would see as a very good thing. The fact that they have um, uh, you know rejoined uh, or that they have uh, you know rejoined the Paris Accords on climate change. Um, 
these are all good things. Uh, but of course, it doesn't mean that every problem on the agenda mm -hmm. will be, you know, solved with the stroke of a pen, certainly not. And one of the big things from our point of view, economically, is the relationship between the United States and the European Union. And mm -hmm. as we all know, that's gone through a slightly rocky period over the last four years. I mean, remember, there are tariffs now, um, US tariffs on European steel and aluminum exports, uh, US um, tariffs in retaliation for the Airbus subsidies, EU tariffs on the US uh, because of the Boeing subsidies. And like, even though we have no involvement, we don't export steel or aluminum, uh, we don't, we're not involved in the, in the um, Airbus project in any way at all, yet uh, about $500 million of Irish exports have been hit by tariffs because of the Airbus dispute. Uh, you know, people on this call will know that butter has become, Kerrygold butter has become more expensive because of tariffs and also uh, Irish cream liqueurs. And we would like to see those tariffs eliminated because it would be a huge benefit to consumers here, but also to our exporters in Ireland. Um, so th my hope would be that, that the more positive attitude towards the European Union will result in a resolution to those trade disputes, which frankly are relatively trivial when you consider the shared interests that Europe and the United States have. Uh, you know, um, trade between the US and the EU represents a third of global GDP. More than half of the investment foreign investment in the US comes from the EU. More than half of uh, international foreign investment in Europe comes from the United States. So we are Siamese twins. We are, you know, in economic terms, we are, you know, we are locked together. We are entangled in beneficial ways. And therefore we need to get rid of these irritations, which are simply, you know, minor irritations, but nonetheless, a minor irritation like these trade tensions between the two sides can result in $500 million worth of Irish exports being affected. Yeah. And that's, that's why the stakes for Ireland are so high when it comes to the EU-US relationship. And the fact is that we know that President Biden and the team around him have a more, an instinctively more positive attitude towards the European Union than their predecessors, who had a, uh -huh. you know, had a particular set of views, which meant that tensions arose on the transatlantic relationship. And I hope mm -hmm. those tensions will now be, not overnight, but over, over the next period of time will, will be you know, removed and that we will see um, the price of Irish, of, of Kerrygold butter coming down by 25%, which would be great. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ambassador. You mentioned uh, the, the EU there, obviously uh, for, for those uh, Irish born or, or that have uh, been following the news recently, they'll have seen, I suppose, the benefits of, of EU solidarity, uh, I suppose, towards Ireland's position on, on Brexit. Um, and obviously your experience uh, both in Brussels and, and as DG of, of EU affairs back back home, you, you know, you fully understand uh, the importance of that EU relationship um, to Ireland. And I think in the EU, we're definitely seen as, you know, a deft, a deft player. Um, yeah. I, I think the question, you know, in our US and Canada strategy, one of the things that we're keen to do is to, is to be seen as, as, as a transatlantic bridge, I suppose, between the US and, and the EU. Um, is this something that you feel we'll be able to do um, under a Biden administration? Um, is it something that, that you think we're well suited to, to, to carry out? Yes. Now, I don't have any illusions about this. We're not, you know, we're not Britain. We, we're, we're not the same size as Britain. We don't have, you know, the defense and security relationship and intelligence relationship with the United States that Britain has. So, you know, we're not, we're not saying that we can replace Britain completely. That's that, that, that would be a, a nonsensical thing to claim. But what I what I do believe is that um, as an English-speaking country, as a country that has unique ties with the United States, I, I, I don't use a special relationship. That's a, a term the British use and not so much used here. But but I say we have a unique relationship because, and, and I say that for two reasons. One is because of the strong traditional links forged by generations of Irish immigrants and the role they've played and the way they become part of the fabric of the United States. That has given us a sort of a, um, a, an anchoring in the United States that few other countries have. But on top of that, then we have the contemporary relationship, which is based on, on huge flows of trade and investment in both directions. So when you have that 
traditional relationship, the person, the person, the, the ties of blood um, and culture um, between two countries. And that's augmented, added to by a strong economic connection that benefits both sides. That's the basis for a, for a unique relationship. And because mm-hmm. we have that relationship with the United States, um, I think we can, we, you know, we can use that in, in ways that help to enhance the EU-US relationship. Because one of the problems is, of course, that the European Union is an unusual construction. You know, it, it, it's not a United States of Europe, full stop. But it's not an international organization either. It's a, it's a hybrid. And therefore, understandably, Americans have difficulty in coming to terms with this strange thing that Ireland happens to be a member of. But all I would say to Irish Americans, and I always say this, is that the European Union has been fundamental to the transformation of Ireland over the last uh, 45 years. When we joined the Union, we were a, a relatively poor uh, West European country. We were lagging way behind the other members of the European Union. We were, a lot of them didn't think we were really fit for membership. And now, 45 years later, 47 years later, um, we are um, a leading global player. I mean, in terms of our, our, our GDP per capita has risen uh, quite dramatically over the last um, uh, four and a half decades, five decades almost now. And, and the European Union has been, been, been uh, fundamental, that transformation. And, 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 and therefore, I, I, I do think that, that, that we should, I, I always say to people when I speak around America that, um, y- that you should be proud as Irish Americans of the fact that the country your people left in misery, fleeing from deprivation and destitution, has now become a leading global economy with a sophisticated um, industry, services, strong services sector, heavily export oriented, globally connected. Um, That is a success story that Irish Americans, I think, can be proud of because they played a part in that. Because the uniqueness of Ireland's achievement is that we've both been anchored in the European Union and we've we've benefited from membership of the EU. And we've also benefited from a very strong relationship with the United States, which, which has encouraged so many American companies to base themselves in Ireland and to, to operate throughout Europe from an Irish base. Thanks, Ambassador. You mentioned, I suppose, that the, you know, the well-known story of, you know, the successes of, of, of U.S. investment in, in Ireland, which, as you said, has really helped to, you know, to lift up uh, the economy. Um, do, do you feel that, I suppose, the very, very positive story of Irish investment in the U.S. is, is as well-known? Well, well I, I, I've tried. I don't think I've ever given a speech or done a virtual call like this with anybody over the last uh, three years without stressing the extraordinary story of Irish investment in the US. The fact that with a population of 5 million now, we are in the top 10 foreign investors in the United States. Fancy that. The fact that there are 100,000 plus Americans who are employed by Irish companies, and that number keeps rising every year. And in my view, it won't be long before there are more Americans working for Irish companies here than there are Irish people working for American companies in Ireland. So that's a story that is, that is really striking uh, because of the small size of, uh, of Ireland's population. To have such a profile in the United States, it shows that our companies, our Irish companies, are doing very well. Uh, they're making profits, they're, 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 they're expanding their operations. And there's only so much they can do to expand their operations in Ireland because a limited market and then Europe is a bigger market. But the United States is always a, a very appealing prospect for an Irish company because you can operate in an English speaking environment and you feel that you can understand the laws. There are no hidden pitfalls as there might be in foreign language environments. So while I would like to see more Irish investment in continental Europe, I think it will happen and it's happening and it's important. But I do think that with Britain now less attractive as a location for Irish investment overseas, I think the United States will become an even more important Mm -hmm. location for Irish foreign direct investment around the world. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, You mentioned, I suppose, Irish companies uh, in in America. I might pivot there from from Irish companies in America to to Irish America. Um, You speak very movingly, I suppose, of your experience. Um, of, of, of Irish America and what you found. Can you speak to us, I suppose, a bit about yeah. that? 
Well, look, you see, I come from a family that has no emigration profile at all, right? My mother was one of eight, and all of her siblings ended up living their lives in Waterford. None of them left Waterford. And my five siblings are all in Waterford as well. So when I was growing up, my knowledge of, of the Irish emigration story was very limited. In fact, almost non-existent because I, didn't, I had no personal experience of a family connection with people living in other parts of the world. And most, a lot of Irish people have that immigration and, and emigration story in their DNA. You know, they, they understand it because they, 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 you know, they had their cousins coming back on holidays every year and so on. We didn't do anything like that. So, and I had not served in America as a younger diplomat. You know, I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't serve here earlier in my career. So I didn't really experience Irish America, except when I was in Kansas City in 1974 as a student, where I was looked after by two wonderful Irish Americans there, Eddie Aylward and John J. Sullivan. And uh, they were great people. And they kind of gave me a sense of what Irish America is like, the generosity of Irish America and the, and, and the, and the passion for Ireland, because both of them were, were so quintessentially Irish in many ways, even though they were probably three generations um, um, away from Ireland in terms of their ancestry. Um, so when I came here, I, I didn't really know what to expect. And so my feeling of, of America, my, my assessment of Irish America is a very positive one because wherever I've been, I've come across communities, individuals and groups with a passionate intensity about their connection with Ireland. People who may be descended from 19th century Irish immigrants, but who yet retain a sense of Irishness, which for me is inspiring and uplifting. Whenever I go and meet an Irish American group, and I do that everywhere I go, not just in Chicago and Boston and New York, which are the traditional strongholds of Irish American sentiment, but, but, but in places like Savannah and Charleston and Houston and Dallas and San Antonio, I mean, you find people all over this country with um, a genuine interest in Ireland, an affiliation with Ireland, an affinity with Ireland, an affection for Ireland. And that is something that is invaluable from our point of view because it means that we're not this small country with 5 million people swimming in a sea of, of turbulence and, and so on. Because the default position of a small country like Ireland is to be ignored and unknown. And our diaspora counters that fact because it gives us an advantage, uh, an asset, which few other countries have. And by the way, other diasporas here are not as connected with their homelands as ours is, right? I mean, I've talked to my colleagues in other embassies, EU embassies here in Washington, and they will tell you that, yes, there are pockets around the place where there are sort of, you know, there's a national, there's a sense of, of, of identity coming from a European country, but that's a rarity. Whereas in, in, with, with us, it's everywhere. There's nowhere I go where I don't come across um, evidence of strong Irish um, American heritage there and strong connections back to Ireland. And the fact is, in 2019, two million Americans visited Ireland. So more than 10% of all the Americans who visited the European continent that year went to Ireland. We have less, we have 1% of the population of the European continent, less actually. And yet we attract 10% of all American tourists who go to Europe. So the affection is there. And it's a huge asset for Ireland. And it's the reason why we, you know, we can, we, we have the kind of access we have here in America is because of the contribution of Irish America. Yeah, it, it is wonderful when you mentioned the, you know, the, the, the number of trips to, to Ireland. And I think a trip to Ireland for, for an Irish American is never just a holiday. Uh, it's so much deeper. It's a, it's a reconnection. Um, and even for those maybe that had, you know, wanted to go maybe once, uh, I, I think they definitely realized they'll be going back again uh, hopefully once travel uh, starts up again uh, and it's safe to do so we'll have we'll have those large numbers again I have a secret mission, I have a secret mission to get as many as possible to visit Louth and um, that's my ulterior motive uh, one of the most beautiful countries can visit, in Ireland uh, Louth, down, the, uh, down the east coast of Waterford as well eh? uh, yeah, uh, along Ireland's ancient east <laughs> exactly exactly um and you mentioned, I suppose, travel and trips and, and, and traveling around the States and getting to meet uh, different communities. Once it's safe to travel again, are there any particular places uh, or communities that you're keen to, to visit or, or events that you're keen to, to, to see? Well, you know, um, 
I, I have a list of all the places I couldn't go to last year, which I had planned to go to. Uh, of course, Chicago, uh, I've been there, but, but I, I would have been back there a couple of times and I'll be definitely coming back to Chicago um, as soon as I can travel again. But I also missed out on visits to Milwaukee. I was due to be in, in Milwaukee three times last year um, for the Milwaukee Irish Fest for the Ryder Cup, which was meant to be played near Milwaukee. Uh, with Porik Harrington as the uh, European captain and Porik someone I know from previous postings uh, and also for the Democratic National Convention and all three of those visits were uh, were were were, um, were cancelled so that'll be one of my uh, one of my priorities um, uh, hopefully get to the Milwaukee Irish Fest this year if it takes place in in person hopefully it will fingers crossed um, and then um, Minnesota was another place I was meant to go and and uh, give out the O'Shaughnessy Poetry Prize, which I was looking forward to doing. And unfortunately, that fell by the wayside too. So that's another one that I'll be definitely including on my itinerary. But I'll be, but I'll be trying to uh, spread my wings uh, because I've been frustrated. My wings have been clipped big time here over the last uh, 10 months and I'm, I'm eager. I'm yearning for the day where I can get back and see people face to face as opposed to on this, uh, on this video screen. I know I speak for the whole community in the Midwest. We look forward to, to welcoming you when, when that day comes. Um, you mentioned the, the, the Poetry Prize, uh, and obviously, you know, you're a, a strong advocate um, of Irish culture. Um, I might just ask a question, I suppose, on cultural diplomacy. Um, what do you think it is about Irish culture that really helps to open those doors uh, for us here, not just in the States, but I suppose uh, around the world as well? Well, I think it's, um, first of all, accessibility. Uh, I remember being at Ho Chi Minh City Airport about 20 years ago, and I was ambassador to Vietnam from Malaysia. I was passing through the airport, and I went into the bookshop, you know, an airport bookshop, so they're the same the world over. But nonetheless, I counted eight Irish authors that were represented in that small bookshop at Ho Chi Minh City Airport, right? And that, to me, was a kind of a revelation. Now, this is what, I mean, it wasn't Joyce and Yates. It was a kind of more popular Irish novelist, but nonetheless, Images of Ireland were being, you know, available for people to connect with, and that's important. So, English language um, uh, is a powerful asset for Ireland. I know that you know we we, we lost our own language, or at least our own language weakened because of the the impact of English. But nonetheless, it has given us a huge asset when it comes to making our work accessible. They don't have to be translated for most people in the world. Who you know, a lot of people who speak English either as a first language or a second language. Uh, the Irish literature um, doesn't have to be uh, translated for them. So it, the barrier is removed uh, from there. And I remember when I was in India, for example, the many people who were interested in Yeats and Joyce and so on. So wherever I've been, I realized that it's a huge asset to us to have a literature that people around the world who are English speakers can actually, uh, can actually access themselves uh, you know, directly without having to go through translations. The second thing is that um, I think emigration has, has done a great deal in the sense that it has when the Irish came to America, they brought their culture with them. And that culture survives, you know, the music, uh, the dance. And I mean, when I was in Chicago, my last visit last year, before you arrived, um, I, was, I was shown a copy of Chief O'Neill's book on mm. the Irish. Uh, and he was someone, uh, uh, I think he was a Chicago uh, police uh, captain, a police um, chief, who actually spent a lot of his life his spare time collecting and publishing Irish music mm -hmm. that that probably was it was available in the Chicago area and nowhere else in the world because it had left Ireland with, with the immigrants who brought it with them. And he recorded all of that. And that's a great resource for um, Irish music to this day. And uh, so that's another reason why the Irish brought it with them and, and they preserved that tradition. And I still go all over this country and I come across people uh, playing uh, Irish music and doing Irish dance. And by the way, of course, Irish dance owes a lot to Chicago as well. Because, you know, river dance, I mean, look, river dance has made Irish dance famous with people who have no Irish connections. I remember in Malaysia, people were, were, were bewitched by Irish dancing and it was all because of river dance. And, and, and uh, so, 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 so Chicago deserves, uh, you know, a, a pat on the back for that one as well, because you brought this kind of uh, you know, American pizzazz to bear on our dancing tradition. So I, I think our music, the fact that our that our traditional music is lively. Mm -hmm. okay, I know people say all our wars are merry and all our songs are sad, but actually we have a lot of lively songs as well. And and, and the passionate 
songs and so on I, I have also got their place. But I, you know, and also all um, every Irish person can sing a song. So that's that, that, that helps that we have this kind of, and we're not afraid to sing, even when our voices are, shall we say, not ideally um, pitched for public performance. <laughs> I think Irish cream liqueurs sometimes help uh, with, uh, with with the courage to sing. Um, Ambassador, we, I spoke at the start about uh, A Farther Shore, uh, your initiative uh, to, to look at Irish history. Can you speak to us a little bit more about, about that and what we can expect uh, from it? Okay. Look, the reason for this is because I believe that 1919 to 22 were the most consequential years in Irish history that Ireland went from being, you know, a country that was um, part of the United Kingdom, part of the British Empire, to being a proudly independent uh, country. Now, of course, not everything was rosy at that time, because partition clearly was something that, that Irish people uh, were very unhappy about for the, for the most part. Um, uh, but nonetheless, um, you know, um, like in 1900, I, I once published a book about 1900 in Ireland uh, about 20 years ago, and um, in 1900, no one would have regarded Irish independence as in any way feasible. The most they were hoping for was some kind of home rule, some kind of self-government, which came about in 1914. And then by the time the, the First World War ended, that no longer satisfied Ireland's needs. And we pushed on for independence. So I, I kind of want to tell that story. And luckily here in the United States, we have quite a number of very gifted historians and scholars in other disciplines who can help us to explore those issues for an Irish American audience. Now, President Higgins is doing something similar in Ireland. Uh, it's called Machnav or you know, Reflection. He's doing a series of these events. But I decided that um, the Irish Revolution story is not just an Irish story. Like if, if, if you were talking about the history of most European countries, we accept, except for the big ones, but most smaller European countries, their history is really a matter that's relevant to themselves and themselves only. But in Ireland, mm -hmm. that's not because we do have a global community. So I'm convinced that, that, that Irish history belongs also to Irish Americans and to people of Irish heritage here in America. So I want to help Irish Americans in a way to, to explore that period in our history, which brought about such a consequential change and in which Irish Americans played a significant role back there 100 years ago. And so I'm doing this with, um, uh, the first one was in collaboration with, with uh, Boston College. Uh, mm -hmm. The next one is with DePaul University in Chicago, which I had the, the privilege of speaking at there about a year and a half ago. Um, um, and then we're doing one with Notre Dame and we have New York University. So we've got a good uh, lineup and we're going to deal with everything from those pe in that period. Next one's on the War of Independence. Then we're doing... Um, uh, you know, the formation of Northern Ireland, then we're doing the treaty uh, 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 negotiations, then, then we're doing, mm -hmm. you know, civil war, and then we're going to do a, um, a kind of a review of the last hundred years. In other words, what was mm -hmm. the legacy of those crucial years in Irish history? What did it give rise to? And what can we say about the, you know, the pros and cons of a hundred years of Irish history? So it's going to be a very interesting series. I'm personally looking forward to it because I've had a, lot, a lifelong interest in this period in our history, and I'm delighted to be able to explore it in the company of so many distinguished historians of Ireland who live and work here in the United States. That's great. Uh, thanks, Ambassador. And I know we look forward to, to, to tuning into those talks. I think the, the Boston College talk, uh, which took place this week, is, is up on their website. So if you, if you want to go back and, and start from the beginning, uh, folks can do that and then, and then join us for, for DePaul and, and, and Notre Dame. Um, uh, just to everyone on the call, if you have any questions, you can just pop them into the chat. Um, I'm going to ask the, the ambassador to, to read us a poem uh, from an Irish poet. Uh, obviously, St. Bridget's Day is, is on Monday. Um, so I've, I'm going to ask the ambassador to read a poem. If you don't have any questions, I, I have some questions on Brexit, uh, and that will keep us talking until about 4 p.m. today. Um, so uh, please pop your questions in. Uh, uh, I don't monopolize all the time. So, ambassador, please, um, a, a poem. Yeah. Uh, this is a poem by um, an Irish poet called Sarah Berkeley, who actually teaches um, creative writing, I believe, in somewhere in California. It might even be at Berkeley University. I'm not quite sure. But anyway, she's an Irish poet. And this is a poem called Famine Cottages. And I think it's quite relevant to today's audience because it looks back to the famine and, and the impact of the famine. But it also looks, looks at 
um, emigration because she talks about her own story of leaving Ireland and the pros and cons, the pluses and minuses of being an emigrant. And I think it, it ca she captures it very well. So it's uh, Sarah Berkeley and it's called Famine Cottages. Um, the horses move across the top of the hill. The water is still a stone below. If I had to let it all in to the places where I feel at home, I'm certain it would take me down. I would be undone. I drown. As it is, there is little purchase on my surface, few ways in. The trees send up their prayers for rain. The hills color up at the mention of spring. This year, I have been more than half my life elsewhere. For so long, I have been other, insular, foreigner with a buried idiom. Across the reservoir, deer paths lace the hillside. In my pocket, two stones and a shell from the beach below the famine cottages at Ross Owen. We used to row there in a skiff. Last night, the driving California rain drove home to me how far away those beaches where we played as kids. Dogs Bay, Inch, Caris Iveen, the dry stone walls squaring off their handkerchiefs of land. New Year's Eve, 1993, I flew across an ocean and 6,000 miles to be where I am now. And this is how I've lived my adult life, away from my original home, in a place with new people, an about face from all I'd known. This is what I chose, the airport departure halls, the agonized farewells, and now these hills, my northern moon, my pre-dawn birds. That's a poem, I think, about the, you know, the, the pluses and minuses of emigration, which I think all of us know. You know, we all miss home, but we also enjoy being where we are, and we're always pulled between the two places. And that's, I think, captures that sense very uh, mm. powerfully indeed. So it's Famine Cottages by Sarah Berkeley. Wonderful. Th thank you, Ambassador. A poem I, I hadn't known, but I'll, I'll, I'll read back to it uh, myself. Definitely some, some themes there that strike a, strike a chord. Um, we have a question from, from Pat Fitzgibbon. Uh, Pat, uh, if you're there, you can pop on your, you can pop on your mic and, and ask your question. Uh, yes, so Ambassador, thank you for joining us. Thank you, uh, Council General Byrne. Uh, it's a pleasure to see both of you. Um, so my question is, uh, with St. Patrick's uh, Month, really, it's become a, a, a month-long celebration. Are there any poems that you find particularly appropriate for the season? Yes, I, I, I suppose I, I always think of, when I think of St. Patrick's Day, I always think of poems of emigration. And Ivan Boland, who died there about uh, last year, um, she has a wonderful poem called The Emigrant Irish, which um, talks about the struggles that the Irish went through and how they managed to assert themselves in the face of adversity in, in the new world. I think that's a poem that I always think fondly of, and I'll be reading that. I'll be posting a reading of that uh, in the coming um, weeks as well as part of our St. Bridget's Day um, commemoration or our St. Bridget's Day celebration. So that's one that I certainly um, always think of um, when I think of St. Patrick's Day. Because I mean, St. Patrick's Day is essentially a day when we Irish commune with the global Irish. Because it's a day when even people with a, with a scintilla of Irish identity, you know, assert it in a very strong way. And that's fine. You know, not everyone, you know, can, can have it as a preoccupation. But what I find in America is that a lot of people do have it as a very important part of their identity. The people on this call and, and millions of others. But St. Patrick's Day is a time when, when the broad sweep of Irish Americans, the 35 million plus, because I think a lot of people assume an Irish identity for St. Patrick's Day that they may not be able to prove, uh, uh, you know, they have an ancestral uh, tree. But, but, uh, but nonetheless, um, uh, St. Patrick's Day is a day when, when I certainly think about our immigrants and the impact they made and the way in which they helped to transform Ireland in many ways, both by remittances they sent home and also then by just being a source of strength for today's Ireland. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Pat. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, we've uh, on, on the St. Patrick's theme, uh, Chris uh, Swanson. Chris, if you're there, you can uh, ask your question. Just pop your um, pop your, uh, your your mic on. Perfect. 
or if not, uh, I can ask Chris was Chris was uh, just speaking about uh, the the wonderful sight of the river going green here and in Chicago, uh, and whether at, at at any time in the future you'd you you'd consider coming down and joining uh, joining to to see the river go green. Well, I I mean, in fact, I, I was there two years ago because in in twenty nineteen uh, the Taoiseach, uh, the then Taoiseach Leo Varadkar, um, after being in Washington, we went to Chicago and we were there for the parade and it was a nice uh, sunny and fa fairly pleasant day. I mean, sunny and, and, and very pleasant to walk the streets of Chicago that day. But after it, we went to the river and um, Tourism Ireland had, had hired a boat and we went down along uh, the river. And I expected there to be a, be a light green tinge on the river. I kind of thought, you know, a little bit of green here and there and you'd have to look carefully to find it. But in fact, I discovered it was a serious green. I mean, this is, this is not just a little, little sort of tint of green. This is, this, is, this is full on, you know, definitely one of the 40 shades and one of the stronger ones, I would have said. So, 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 I, so I was thrilled by it. And I, I'd like to go back there again. I have a wonderful photograph. Uh, in fact, one of our, my wife and I, our favorite photograph is the two of us standing with a Taoiseach with this mass of green behind us. And uh, it's, it's almost hard to believe that you could turn a river that color green um, on the occasion of St. Patrick's Day. So fair play to the, to the people of Chicago and to the Plumbers Union for the, uh, for the environmentally friendly way in which they turn the river green. Wonderful, thanks, thanks Ambassador. We have a question uh, now from uh, Mike Mitchell uh, from, from uh, the Milwaukee Irish Fest. Uh, Mike, if you're there, you can switch on your mic. I just wanted to invite everybody. Uh, the ambassador uh, has been very generous in supporting the AICF conference. That'll be this Monday, the St. Bridget's concert. And I would invite everybody to partake in it at no cost. It'll be available um, both through YouTube and Facebook. And the link is on the uh, messages here on the side if you want to see the link for it. So we we'll hope everybody can join. Uh, you know, I... Um... I had intended um, to do a tour of the festivals last summer, but unfortunately, all of that came to grief. So I'm hoping to be able to do uh, my sort of festival tour in 2021. Fingers crossed, okay? And we hope that you can make it. We do plan on having the festival. Good. Well, I, well if you have it, I'll be there. I promise. Excellent. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Uh, and we'll post that on our on our Twitter as well, uh, all the details uh, for, for that concert. Um, DD Simon, uh, you have a question about um, uh, the, the grandparent rule and citizenship. DD, if you're if you're there, you can hop on your mic. Uh, yes, um, this is wonderful. Thank you, Ambassador and um, uh, Kevin. Um, with regards to, you know, foreign birth, it only goes back to grandparents. Would they ever extend that to um, citizens of uh, America that have been able to get their Irish citizenship and extend it to their children? You know, like my children? <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, look, um, the current law in Ireland, the cur current citizenship law is that, you know, you, you, um, you're entitled to Irish citizenship, um, if you either have obviously Irish born, an Irish parent, or one grandparent born on the island of Ireland. But if it's a grandparent, you have to go through the FBR. And, um, and then um, if you get citizenship through a grandparent, you can pass that on to any children that you may have after you've acquired citizenship. So it, so it can go down um, beyond the grandparent uh, level, but uh, but but obviously only if only, only in certain circumstances. Now there are other ways that people, uh, you know, can apply, um, you know, for our citizenship through association. There 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 there's you know there's this provision in the in in, in the law for that to uh, to happen. And then of course a, a lot of people now acquire citizenship through naturalization, whereby they live in Ireland for a certain number of years and then they apply for our citizenship. And in fact, um, you know, we're now getting a very um, varied. Um, group of people acquiring citizenship in Ireland and we well in in the pre-pandemic days we would have these large uh, swearing in ceremonies for four or five thousand people and usually there would be 90 nationalities uh, included in those uh, ceremonies um, uh, reflecting the fact that now we have one in six people uh, living in Ireland uh, wasn't born in Ireland so we you know we have a lot of people with other backgrounds living in Ireland and some of them 
after a number of years, you know, choose to acquire citizenship. And that's, that's, that's fine under Irish law as well. So, I mean, obviously our country is evolving all the time. And, and one of the evolutions that's occurred is in our appreciation of our diaspora, which uh, I think up to 20 years ago, we took for granted a little bit. But now I think we've, in the last 20 years, we've been much more active in trying to engage with the diaspora. We now have a minister responsible for the diaspora, which we didn't have before. We have the Emigrant Support Programme, which has now, you know, reasonably significant funding available to support um, Irish um, groups around the, around, the, around the world and to, to, to support the welfare of Irish citizens. In fact, our government made money available there um, in, the, in the summer, in the first half of the year, uh, to deal with or to respond to welfare needs of Irish uh, people around the world affected by the pandemic. And that included uh, funding that was supplied to Irish organizations in uh, New York, Boston, Chicago, and elsewhere. So, so I, think, I, think our, I think we're on a journey with our diaspora. And it's a journey that um, is a, a positive forward moving uh, journey, but, and where exactly it will end. I mean, you know, there are proposals, as you know, uh, to give the vote to Irish citizens who live abroad, that will have to be the subject of a referendum at some point in the future, but the current the government's committed to that. Um, so, you know, things are evolving, but at the moment, uh, all I can say is that the law is as it is, and there are certain ways of getting our citizenship and, and it doesn't automatically go beyond the grandparent uh, level. Thanks, thanks, Ambassador, and thanks, uh, Didi, for, for the question. Um, just, I suppose, on the subject of, of, of citizenship and passports, um, we uh, have two presentations. We have a presentation with uh, ICS Midwest uh, around uh, getting your passport. Uh, we'll tweet out the link to that. It's about 10, 15 minutes. Really, really helpful if you're thinking of applying for your passport. Uh, and then our colleagues in San Francisco have a really useful presentation on citizenship. So foreign, what's called foreign birth registration, FBR. Uh, we'll tweet that out uh, as well. Ambassador, uh, we've come up now to, to the hour um, and I want to let, let everyone continue their days. And I know that you've got uh, lots of administration officials to, to, to reach out to and make new connections with. Um, so any, any final reflections for, for, for 2021 before we, before we close? Yeah, well, 2021 is going to be a, a very important year um, for Ireland. Um, like everyone in the world, we, we have to conquer this virus. And at the moment, we're in lockdown until the 5th of March. And uh, the number of infections has come down. Uh, it was 9,000, 8,000 8, there uh, just a few weeks ago. And now it's down to about uh, 1,300, I think, the last couple of days. And um, it's on a downward uh, trend. Um, and the, you know, the, or, you know, the reproduction rate is now between 0 0.4 and 0 0.7, which is a sign. And the number of hospitalizations is decline the number of new people being hospitalized has gone down so i won't say we're, we're you know we're over the worst because we thought that in the summer and and look what happened but but um but, but certainly we've managed to bring it down from a dangerously high level only a few weeks ago to still a high level by the way um i mean if you multiply by 60 to get the population equivalent for america that would be about 80,000 90,000 uh, cases a day in america now you've got a lot more than that and and uh, but still it's 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 high level and we have to keep working to bring it down uh, you know, the vaccination program, like everywhere in the world, is, you know, is rolling out, but, you know, it, it, it's going to take time uh, to get it done. And then the other big thing is, is um, you know, obviously the economic recovery. Now, all the economists are forecasting strong recovery uh, for Ireland because we have such strong fundamentals in our economy. So, um, but still, it's, it's going to be a challenge because we've had to borrow significant amounts uh, over the last uh, year to cope with the cost of uh, managing the pandemic and the economic fallout from it. That's going to be a, be a, be a big challenge for us and, and certainly a big part of my role here in the next year will be trying to promote Irish, um, Irish tourism when that becomes possible again, um, you know, promote Irish exports here and promote Irish promote investment in, uh, into Ireland because we, we do need to have a continuing flow of investment from the United States. We're to keep up, we're to keep if we're to continue to be a cutting edge country, we can't just sit back and say we have enough now, we're fine. We have to keep because a lot of those companies will eventually, you know, move on or they will decline and their industries will change and so on. We need new cutting edge uh, investments from the United States and they continue to come, which is a very good thing. Even during the pandemic, we've had a lot of success in the last year in bringing in new US investments into Ireland. And that, and that needs to continue and we need to support that in every way we can. Um, and then, of course, there's also the getting used to Brexit. The fact is that we, we're now in a different world in that our nearest neighbor is no longer a member of the European Union. And uh, that is creating, you know, some teething troubles, to be frank, you know, because the new arrangements are not 
um, you know, they're you know they're difficult because remember that um, people exporting to Britain for the last twenty years, thirty years, didn't need any documentation at all. Now there's customs declarations to be made, and that's just causing extra costs for companies and also getting used to it as being a problem. Now these are teething troubles which we get over, but there's no way around the fact that it won't be as easy for Irish companies to do business in Britain from now on as it was for the last few decades, and it won't be as easy for British companies to do business in Ireland. So that economic relationship is going to suffer. Um, and what's happened now in Ireland is that Brexit is actually forcing us to intensify our relations with our European partners. And one of the big developments has been there's now a lot more direct ferry services, direct roll-on, roll-off services from Ireland direct to France and, and uh, Netherlands and, and Belgium, uh, because we need to avoid having to go through Britain, where there may be difficulties because of controls and log jams and so forth. So I think people in Britain and British businesses and British government are realizing that there's a permanent disadvantage to being outside the European Union. And a lot of them are wondering why they didn't know about this before they decided to leave. Um, but look, I mean, you know, we, we, we are where we are and we can't wish away Brexit, but it's mm -hmm. going to be a challenge for Ireland to deal with it. And then the third thing for Ireland is being a member of the UN Security Council for the next two years, which is a, a huge thing. I mean, we managed to win election against Canada, a country that's like six times our um, population and, you know, a, a member of the G7 and so on, you know, a major world power. Um, or at least a regional power anyway, and, and a country with a lot of, a lot of, a lot going for it. We managed to win it over Canada, but now we have to uh, discharge our responsibilities. And, you know, the world is not exactly a picnic place at the moment. There's a lot going on and we have to face up to these challenges. And uh, we've happily, we put the resources in. We now have a very big mission in uh, New York, which is working very hard to make sure that Ireland, not, we don't just want to be there to make up the numbers, you fill the seat. We want to actually make an impact. And we hope we can do that. And, and our, our impact will be in areas of human rights. Um, we're working on the Iran brief, uh, which is a difficult one, obviously. We're working on the Syria brief, making sure that humanitarian aid can continue to flow to Syria in the years ahead. Um, we're working on the issue of women, peace and security, and climate and security. So these are a lot of big issues that we've been given some kind of um, pen-holding role where we have to kind of be active in trying to steer those things forward. It's going to be a major challenge for Ireland over the next uh, two. But one that we're really ready for, because look, the big thing I would say is that the last time we were on the Security Council in 2000, I think we still saw ourselves as a kind of a rising country, that we were still trying to make our way up the, you know, the, you know, the greasy pole uh, and establish ourselves, you know, fully. I think in the last 20 years that's happened. And I think we now realize that we're not just a country that wants to benefit from international in, um, advantages, that we also have to contribute to it. And that, I think, is motivating our current Security Council role, is a sense that we have something to say and do, and we now have the resources to be able to do these things. Uh, and we're trying to make sure that we acquit ourselves fully as a country that has the wherewithal to play a significant role at the UN, but also has a sense of fairness and a sense of solidarity with smaller countries and struggling countries that maybe other nations in our position might not have. So we have our history that keeps us connected with those struggles of other countries. We also have the, we have the contemporary Ireland, which is capable of putting the resources in to making a real go of our membership of the Security Council. So those are the sort of three big sort of issues for us in the year ahead. Ambassador, uh, thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, I think we'll have you back in in a number of months to to check in on on how all of that is all how all of that is going, uh, and at some stage, hopefully this year, to to have you here in in, in person. I hope um, so. Fingers crossed. <laughs> fingers crossed. Uh, to everyone here, if you didn't get your question answered, you can send an email at uh, chicagogen at dfa.ie. Um, and, and we'll reach out to you to, to make sure that we get your question answered. Um, do please uh, tune in for, for all of the St. Bridget's Day events. Uh, we'll tweet them out uh, uh, just after this call, so you have details of them. Uh, again, our first uh, event for our design month is uh, on the 4th of, of February. Uh, Marty Fahey, it'll be a, a fascinating 
uh, overview of, of, of the contribution of women. Uh, and then I'm glad that the ambassador spoke about um, Ireland's uh, role on the UN Security Council in April. The consulate here plans uh, a month of events um, on Ireland's contribution on the world stage. So an opportunity to tune in for that. Uh, just uh, to, to close, Ambassador, thank you so much uh, for your time. Uh, we ran over, uh, but uh, thank you. So thanks for the generosity of your time. And for everyone, thank you for, for tuning in today. Have a, a nice and a safe weekend. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Sláin a